Our next topic is lobsters. Western Australia versus the New England region of the US, let's say the state of Maine. And the New York Times had a very interesting investigative series on this topic. An excerpt from one of their articles appears in an old final exam that I gave in 3250 a few years back. The situation in New England is that it's become pretty difficult to be a lobster fisherman. The, the regulatory scheme is open access. And as we've seen in lots of other contexts, open access leads to increasing levels of effort, which then lead to increasing costs and therefore decreasing profits. Uh, in the graph on the right, we've, I've used that uh, before, we can, it's the same kind of story. Um, as the level of effort, first the level of effort is small, but as it gets higher and higher and higher, costs rise rapidly, revenues don't rise as much, and so profits fall. So now, lobster fishermen in the state of Maine, you know, they often have to wake up really early in the morning, the boats head out around maybe 4.30 a.m., they have to travel long distances to find lobsters because there aren't any lobsters close to the shore anymore. Uh, it's it's a dangerous work um, and costs are so high that profits are very slim. It's a difficult way to earn a living. And What's interesting is the contrast between that and the situation in Western Australia. In Western Australia, ITQs are used. Australia and New Zealand, by the way, are real pioneers in the use of ITQs, and they use them for a lot of their fisheries. So the New York Times sent a journalist to Western Australia to see what it's like to be a lobster fisherman there often live in small towns there, and in these small towns, lobster fishermen are often the richest people in the town. They aren't getting up at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> in fact, they usually only fish for a few hours every day. If the weather is at all bad, they don't fish that day. It's not at all characterized by a race to fish because each one has their own quotas. They can you know, catch those fish whenever they want to, so there's no particular reason to hurry. Because costs are so much lower, their profits are pretty high, and that's why uh, being a lobster fisherman in Western Australia is really uh, quite a nice way to earn a living. So the journalist who was in Western Australia, they went back to, to the lobster fisherman in New England and raised the issue of ITQs with them, and Told, told them about the experience in Western Australia. But again, the, just like with the case of the brine shrimp, the, the U.S. fishermen were too wary of changing to a new regulatory method. Already, they're just barely squeaking by, and they're worried that if you went to a new regulatory method, they just go bankrupt. And so nothing's changed in terms of regulatory methods uh, in the US and this contrast between lobsters in Western Australia and in New England persists today. So our next topic is Atlantic tuna. Here I just wanted to make a comment that Americans often think the Europeans are more environmentally sensitive than Americans are, but there are situations in which that's not true and Atlantic tuna is one of those situations. We used to think that Atlantic tuna lived in two populations, one in the western part of the Atlantic Ocean and one in the eastern part. And here I'm talking about the North Atlantic. So in the western part, it's the coast of the US. The eastern part, it's the coast of Europe and, and to some extent the Mediterranean Sea. The, the uh, eastern population of tuna in the North Atlantic is in a lot of trouble. The Europeans have been over, overfishing that stock for decades. 
the stock size has been falling, it's, uh, it's a real problem. In the western part of the North Atlantic, you have the United States regulating the tuna fishing industry. And that system of regulation has been much more strict, but it hasn't been completely successful. Even though the biologists st uh, strictly regulate how much fishing there is for tuna off the coast of the U.S., the stocks were not really recovering as much as uh, everybody thought they ought to. This was a puzzle until a few years ago when it was discovered that the tuna that are in the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean don't spend all their lives there. Many of them actually swim completely across the Atlantic Ocean to the other side and, that gl and, and spend their time in European waters where, of course, they're subject to European fishing regulations and uh, where they get overfished. And so the reason why the U.S. stocks have not been able to recover is because of European overfishing. Um, the Europeans now know this. There was a meeting in Spain about, I want to say, three or four years ago in which they pledged to do better and then they uh, said they were going to reduce the quota of tuna fishing that's allowed for for Euro European fishermen to catch. And they did reduce the quota, but I think it was a, a reduction of something like 2 or 3%. So really not enough to make any difference in terms of trying to rescue that severely depleted uh, fish stock of, uh, of tuna. The, the next topic here is marine reserves. Colin Clark, the person whose name I've listed here, is a retired professor actually of mathematics from the University of British Columbia. And he got interested in fisheries economics in, I believe, the 1970s and wrote a book called Mathematical Bioeconomics, which was really the the foundation text that generated the kind of thinking about fisheries economics that we've been talking about in this chapter and that I talk about all the way to Econ 7250. Clark was quite saddened by the collapse of the cod fishery off the coast of Canada in the early 1990s and wondered whether his research and his models were the cause of this collapse. Uh, we now know that wasn't the cause. Uh, it's true that the fisheries biologists were, were using some of his models, but if the government had listened to the fisheries biologists, everything would have been fine. Instead, the government was listening to the fishing industry, which wanted uh, much higher quotas than the biologists. But in any case, uh, Clark, um, thinking about this, wondered whether there was some alternative to the kind of theory that he had spent most of his career creating and that we've learned about in this chapter to, uh, to make sure that you don't have an important collapse of a fishery, that you don't make a big mistake. We've been supposing that you know what the fish stock is, but it's really hard to know. You can't count fish in the ocean very well. It's really hard to know what the fish stocks are. And so there's some uncertainty, and that's another thing that he worried about. So Clark's idea was, instead of regulating all fisheries according to the kind of models that we talked about in this chapter, set aside some parts of the ocean to be marine reserves. So these marine reserves are kind of like national parks. They're areas where no fishing is going to be allowed. And this way, if you happen to mess up the areas that, where fishing is allowed, at least in the marine reserves, things are going to be okay. Now, when Clark suggested this in the early 1990s, it was a purely academic idea. There were no such reserves. but. Now, as I'm speaking in 2020, there are actually quite a few marine reserves that have been set up. The United States has set up marine reserves off the coast of New England, off the coast of Hawaii, off the coast of California. So this is a, an increasingly popular idea now.
to make sure that if you mismanage fisheries regulation where there is fishing, that at least there are going to be some areas where the fish are going to be left undisturbed and those areas could help repopulate the other areas if you have messed up the, the regulation of these other areas. So that's our um, last topic on a last sort of historical story. Um, the next video will talk about these last few things I want to mention.